care, lead, innovate, motivate, balance. These five tenants reveal ways of creating a more profitable and customer-centric pharmacy. What will you discover when you climb with RMS? Good morning, everybody, and welcome to CLIMB. I'm Brad Jones, the founder and CEO here at Retail Management Solutions, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Marge CLIMB event. With me, as always, is our Director of Operations and my co-host, Brandon Bolesky. Good morning, Brandon. Good morning, Brad. So last month's CLIMB featured Hardig Drug CEO, Charlie Hardig. He joined us for a discussion on Mark Cuban's new company, Cost Plus Drugs. Uh, we also had business coach Emily Kanata join us for a discussion on communication strategies that can help you address cost plus drugs and other online competitors. Now, today marks our first episode in a series that will be devoted to clinical services, and Brad will kick that off in just a moment here. Uh, after Climb today will be a special segment on RMS customers, uh, for RMS customers, all about credit card processing options. Uh, Brad, go ahead and tell us a little bit about what we have in store for clinical services. Yeah, so we're going to be talking about uh, remote patient monitoring today. And when I was preparing for this, I asked a lot of pharmacists about this, and most didn't really know much. Uh, so we're really pl uh, pleased to have back uh, two people that are veterans of CLIMB uh, and industry experts. So um, I have with us today uh, Amina Abubakar and Bob Lominick. Uh, so Amina is a pharmacist, and she owns the RX Clinic Pharmacy and is also the president of um, uh, Avant Institute, which offers clinical services training to pharmacists, techs, and students. Uh, Amina is an industry pioneer and is responsible for standardizing many clinical service practices, including uh, our today's topic, remote patient monitoring. Now, Bob Lominick is a pharmacist and owner of the Tyson Drugstores. Uh, many of you recognize Bob uh, for his work in medication synchronization. He's the industry expert in that, and he's also a champion of remote patient monitoring. So uh, in just a moment, I'm going to bring those two on, and we're going to have a really nice conversation uh, on, on that topic. So uh, we'll show you a quick uh, splash screen, and they'll be back with me. Welcome back, everyone. Good morning, Amina. Good morning, Bob. Welcome back to CLIMB. It's great to have you back. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So as I was getting prepared to talk about remote patient monitoring today, I asked a few of our customers about it, and I found that a lot of them don't know what it is. Um, so let's just start there. Tell us, uh, um, what is remote patient monitoring? What's it all about? Why don't we start? Amina, go ahead and start. Sure, so remote patient monitoring is also known as remote physiological monitoring. And this is when, um, at least in the Medicare population right now, it's where you can give a patient a device and you're able to get real time data into the provider. So this is not where you can upload your results later. This is real time feedback. And so identifying patients that would be a great candidate for monitoring in between visits. And the goal is that if we catch things early, we would prevent unnecessary hospitalization, unnecessary costs uh, incurred into care. So that's in a nutshell. Yeah, and just okay. to follow up, it, it, you know, most, most patients, um, to just carry it a little step further of what Amina said, most patients, they go to the primary care physician um, every six months, roughly twice a year. Well, if you've got a patient that's diabetic or hypertensive patient, a lot can happen in six months if, if not followed closely. Uh, and we can pick up trends by giving them these devices and to elaborate a little bit more. For example, if a patient's at home and they checked her blood pressure, it sends us that reading in real time, as Amina said, and we see it on a daily basis and we can monitor it. So if they, we see a trend where the patient's going in the wrong direction, we can intervene. And um, with, with these relationships we have, we actually have, um, have uh, access to the patient's electronic health record so we can communicate back to the prescriber pretty rapidly. Okay, so, so with that said, 
can can pharmacists just do this on their own? Can a pharmacy just decide we want to do this and set it up, or do you need to be involved with uh, with a doctor or, or a provider? So there are two ways to think about this. These are devices that are available, right? They could be patients that could benefit that are not Medicare, and this does not stop a pharmacy for offering blood pressure monitoring or weight management and support patients in a cash model because we are entering the world of digital health, digital therapeutics, and I think pharmacies can set themselves up Historically, pharmacists have always had patients come to the pharmacy to get blood pressure reading, right? And we give them a logbook. Uh, now that we are able to do things digitally, I could see a pharmacy being able to use these same uh, devices and come up with a cash price. So that's where I'm, I'm okay. seeing that it's possible because, for example, we have a, one of our pharmacists that manages uh, lifestyle and weight loss. And so those patients, a lot of times, either have high blood pressure or have diabetes or are trying to lose weight. So giving them the scales and devices that communicate with her uh, has been uh, put in part of the program into weight loss. So that's kind of a cash is king model. But then uh, I'll, I'll let Bob answer on the other side so we both get to talk together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, certainly. Uh, and, and that is a great model, Amina. And, and just to, to uh, feed on that a little bit, you know, we, we uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, our leadership team was meeting uh, and it just hit me one day that, that and I forgot what the topic was, but it, it dawned on me that we've got hundreds of patients coming in every, every day and getting blood pressure medications. But do we really know what's happening with their blood pressure? And it was embarrassing. I've got patients and quite a bit older than Amina, that been getting blood pressure medicine for me for 20 years, but we've never followed their blood pressure. That's one example, and we can do that with diabetes and so many other things. And like Amina said, even on a cash basis, but I think the original model was if you uh, can get in a relationship with a, with a clinic, a lot of these services are billable, billable through the clinic. And correct me if I'm wrong, Amina, you're the, you're the expert. So we, the pharmacies, and most of us, especially in the rural areas like we are, we have a good relationship with these providers. And the model, you, you have to present your model to where, um, Guy, and, and we could get into more than just remote patient monitoring there, uh, but we'll stick to that, uh, to where the physician's office can actually bill for this service. And then you create a contract, a split of revenue. We cannot bill Medicare for that, but the clinic can bill. So we use that relationship to help that patient take care of, of those patients uh, remotely, and they can certainly bill for that service, and then we, we split some revenue. Yes, and uh, to add to what Bob is saying is that Medicare is looking at total spend, right? And imagine as a pharmacist, how many times a patient has left their doctor's office with a new prescription or increased dose of a blood pressure, and we fill it, and who knows what happens after that, so we might wait three or six months for a patient to go back. What if all those months, the blood pressure was not under control? And also Medicare has never paid for those devices. So most of our Medicare patients have never had a blood pressure monitor at home. Mm -hmm. So sure. when Medicare opened this up and they called it the remote physiological monitoring, it was to increase access and to increase access in between visit. So Medicare has a model where it pays the, what we call the QHP, a qualified health professional, the doctor, the NP, the PA, who is the primary provider for this patient. But we know they are so busy, right, Bob? They barely have time to return your prior auth. They barely have time to see the patients that are waiting for them. And post COVID, these gaps have even increased farther. Right. Right, so we sure. see this as an ideal partnership where a pharmacy can go right to these providers and say, I want to be part of your clinical team and I can handle the logistics of getting these devices to the patients. I can monitor and only triage to you what, you know, warrants the provider to pay attention to. And so our team can be that clinical and guess what? 
we can troubleshoot. We are the ones who can send extra batteries to the patient's home because they are not monitoring anymore. So if you look at it in terms of Medicare, this is where the collaboration matters. And I feel like pharmacists provide more value than just the data of blood pressure is up, blood pressure is down, but key points to educating these patients and getting them to the desired outcomes. You know, we've, we've argued for, for years that, that we see the patient a lot more than, than the prescriber. And so this, this, uh, this gives us a seat at the table and we can, we can help monitor that patient in between those six month visits. Like I said earlier is we see them every month and we have more communication with them than the prescriber. So who in a better position to monitor this? Sure. Well, and you know, when you think about something like blood pressure, I mean, that can vary dramatically in any given day, right? I mean, you could, you could get your blood pressure under control, but you, you go into the doctor and you're just nervous and your blood pressure is higher, even though it's been great the entire time or vice versa, you know? I mean, so, so uh, blood pressure in particular is something if it's being monitored every day, that gives you a much better picture than the, than, than you just walked into the doc- doctor's office and he's going to spend 15 minutes with you if you're lucky. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and they look at just the blood pressure at that point in time. So that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, diabetics, I mean, A1C, you can monitor and that's what 30 days, something like that. It gives a, a, a feel of how things have been over the last 30 days. But even that, like you might mentioned, if they're only going in once or twice a year, that, that, that just makes all the sense in the world. So let me ask this. So, in in either model, um, are you is there revenue from? Do you sell these devices, or are you giving the device to the patient? Or I guess it's really up to you. But what would be the typical situation? So if you're dealing with Medicare, Medicare has specific guidance, in that they have four codes that are available in the medical billing world, and the first code is what we call the nine nine four five three, where you're paid about nineteen to twenty one dollars to just set up the device and connect it to a platform that can bring this data in. So this is whether you have a scale, a blood pressure, you could have three devices, but it's one fee to connect that patient to this cloud, right? And then after that, you can go ahead and Medicare allows per month about $50 to $60 to either afford this device, afford internet, for the patient. So a lot of times these devices and the cost is not passed on to the patient. So Medicare has what we call the, um, the, mon- uh, the transmission code. And because some patients, we've had to pay cellular for some patients because they don't have Wi-Fi, right? So the provider has been given a budget, 56 to $61 every single month to do whatever it takes to get these devices to the patient. So in our model and in the Medicare, the guidance that I've seen, no one is selling these products to the patients. And then lastly, you have the monitoring one. It's like every 20 minutes of interacting with the patient allows you to document your time. And 20 minutes is about $50, $55. And every additional 20 minutes is about $40. So there's a setup that if Bob was looking at a patient's blood pressure and it's all whack, before he calls the doctor, Bob is going to research. Did you take the pills? You know, what else is happening? Well, you at a Super Bowl party and you drank a lot. You had a lot of Doritos. Like, what is going on? <laughs> and that time, a lot of times pharmacists would do that normally and not get paid. So having a monitoring ability to to get paid uh, has been a game changer to help the population. Sure. So let me ask two questions from that. First, about the device. Does the de- will the device come from the doctor or will the do- device come from the pharmacy? And then if the device comes from the pharmacy and uh, you're getting reimbursed through the doctor, is that how that's happening or? Yeah, that's sure. so we I, I don't know what Amina does, but we actually uh, set the patient up in the pharmacy. We want to make certain they, they're using the device properly because, as Amina said, some of them have never used one at all. And she mentioned cellular service. Uh, certainly, I'm in rural Mississippi. majority of our patients are. It is a cellular service. So we, we have to get all that uh, set up, and uh, we do that in the pharmacy and make certain the patient is actually 
capable and, and using the device properly. So, and it is built obviously again through the to the medical clinic that we have a relationship with. Okay. Yeah. So we do very similar to Bob, where we hold, we get the devices, and we become the uh, navigators, right? right? Just because pharmacy is already uh, trained very similar to DME, right? So you get the devices sure. for the patient, you set it up. Now, the in order to bill for that device code, so we can make sure the provider can pay us the patient has to test or use the device 16 days in a month, right? So you have to motivate the patient to give you 16 readings. Then you're able to bill the 99454. And when you get that money, it allows you to afford to, to keep these devices. Right. Uh, Brad, quick example of how this happened. I just, I just thought of this. Uh, today is Tuesday, yesterday morning. When I came into the office, I heard my team uh, calling one of our patients and um, pointing out that, that we got some low blood pressure readings over the weekend. And he questioned that patient on uh, what was going on. As Amina said, it was anything particular that was going on because this particular patient, her, her blood pressures were extremely low. So he was able to, to pick that up um, over the last several days. And, and I'm not sure what action he took and what the result was, but I just overheard that conversation yesterday morning. Okay. So that's a great example of, of where, where this thing works. As I'm listening to both of you, uh, and I'm assuming that these people that are listening today that have never heard of remote patient monitoring or don't know much about it, this sounds hard. <laughs> um, so tell me what is there, there must be some technology uh, that helps you um, through this or or is it or is it difficult? I think the hardest part for pharmacists is to get their collaborating provider. Mm -hmm. You know, okay. But uh, technology is a dime a dozen. These things are available everywhere. That's the easy part. Right. You can get a platform. You can get devices. Unlocking your partner. You know, unlocking that potential biller as a provider who wants to work with you, I think is where most of the pharmacists have struggled. Well, and so, Amina was, was certainly the pioneer in this. And, uh, and I can remember uh, on the beginning talking to her, she said, that's going to be your, your biggest hurdle is getting in that first clinic. And looking back on my experience, that was exactly correct. It took us six months, but once we got in that clinic and proved our value, and show, uh, show the, the prescribers and the medical clinic how we could work together, then the next few clinics were a lot easier. So, so there's, there's, then there's some, there's a multiple software platforms, it sounds like, multiple platforms. So when you, you get your provider signed up, um, then, and you do your first patient, uh, and you get them, you're on Medicare, and you get them the devices, and you get them, Sign, uh, you get them 16 days or all those things that you have to do. Um, is that software communicating with the, with the provider and the provider then has to do something or is it the billing no, you just become happen the, in the back provider. So you become, you the, become provider. the provider. So also what I tell folks is before you go and sign up for a platform, maybe that provider you're working with already has a built in remote monitoring in their electronic medical records. That's why I say leave technology last, right? Okay. Uh, it's very similar when pharmacy was evolving into uh, patient care management, not all of our dispensing systems had e-care plans, right? So we had to go outside and, 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 and get technology that had it. And now many uh, pharmacy management system have it. So I'm seeing trends where two, three years ago, remote monitoring modules were not in the medical record, uh, um, EHRs, sure. the electronic health records, but now we see there's a marketplace within and they can turn on that module, right? But the idea is that whether you turn that module into the physician's <laughs> electronic medical record or you have a standalone, your pharmacy team is the one that gets those alerts. That is the benefit of your partnership. Provider is already overwhelmed. They don't need 500 alerts every, every hour. <laughs> sure. Well, and that, I think that, that was kind of where, where I was going because 
you know, is it, I'm like, is this a tough sell to, to, to the uh, provider? Because now the provider has extra work to do, but it doesn't sound like the provider, once you've signed them up, if I'm understanding this correctly, once you've convinced them to do this and you sign them up, then they don't have to hit deal with the billing. You're taking care of that under their, uh, under their umbrella. No, not the billing. So you're taking care of the service. Okay. Okay. You're taking care of the service. They have to bill it, whether they teach you and allow you to go and adjudicate those claims within the system, because the money is going to go back to their account and you're going to have to reconcile with them to pay you for the patients that you've monitored or you've serviced. So a, a lot of times pharmacies use that, uh, the billing and billing is used loosely. Well, this patient does not belong to us. We're the clinical uh, extenders for the providers. So we are contractually doing the service. They have to bill for the service, but we can make it easier and easier every day. Now, I know we, we Brad, answer to, to maybe help with that. We, we certainly work with the biller to make certain they're billing what we're doing correctly. And once we, I guess, and I don't know whether Mina does that, but we, we certainly monitor them for a while to make certain that our services are getting billed. And again, we have access to their records. So we'll see when that payment comes in and we'll see, uh, you know, we, we track obviously how much that, that provider owes us, if that makes sense. Sure. Okay. So it actually doesn't sound too difficult. I mean, and I think that was when I was listening to the discussion initially, it was like, wow, this sounds hard. It's um, like anything else. You know, it's a little work on the front end. It's not complicated, but once everybody understands and gets on the same page, then it flows. You know, you think about it, the patients that we're working with, they, they you know, unless there's an issue, uh, everything's going well, but we are monitoring it. So there's very, you know, and, and I'll, most states have collaborative practice agreements. So we could actually make the changes ourselves and never have to bother the prescriber. Yep. This is a good, uh, I feel yeah. like a good step towards pharmacy and providers coming close together and getting yep. more delegation uh, in helping them manage these complex patients. Sure. So the, uh, and I, I imagine this has to be different because if there's multiple uh, software platforms, everyone is going to do things a little bit differently. But um, generally, I would think, or t tell me about the, you know, how you're monitoring. Let's say you've signed up 500 patients. I don't know if that's realistic or not, but let's uh, say you've signed up 500 patients. You obviously don't have time to look at 500 patients' records every single day, uh, I wouldn't think, unless you have a staff member that does that full-time. So how, how do you monitor? Our technicians get up in the morning, they get into the dashboard, and it's color-coordinated. Yes. So it sorts with the red, yellow, green. So they won't prioritize the patients that are within the normal range. They'll definitely go through the red and they'll either call the patient to figure out the first things is like, did you take your medication before we go to these numbers? If the patient says yes, then they'll retest it again, then they'll escalate it to the pharmacist. So because this is not meant like emergency, so if we didn't see it right off the bat, we are not in right. trouble, right? It's meant for chronically monitoring the patient. But most of all these systems have a have a system where you can just identify those that you should worry about right away. Yeah, that make the platform makes it easier. They, as she said, they color code, you know, obviously the red patients, uh, we want to act on those, you know, first. Uh, so sure. it, the, the platform makes it easier, I guess, is the simplest way. Yep. So in your cases, what's been the overall impact of implementing uh, RPM? Well, from the clinical side, again, we're creating that relationship. But, and this, this turns into to other relationships as well. You know, you, you, you're creating a bond there with those prescribers that, you, that you've had, uh, but now it, it, it's making that bond even stronger and they start relying on you for other information. It leads to, to other things, which leads to more revenue that's not subject to DIR fees and clawbacks and uh, there's no product involved other than the, 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 the device itself once it's paid for. So it's a service. We're finally getting paid for clinical services. Yep. And also okay. what we noticed is patients who are being monitored do better. 
-hmm. for whatever reason, if that number is facing them, they are improving. Because once we get patients on these devices, it takes one or two months and it's corrected. So uh, I think that has been a huge benefit for the practices. One of my favorite sayings is anything measured improves, anything measured and reported on improves exponentially. So uh, that backs up what I mean, it says it's amazing when you start monitoring how much better they do. Sure. And I think that makes sense psychologically for people. You know, they know that that and it's yeah, it, it makes total sense. So and and I guess that creates some loyalty, I get as well with the patient who now feels better and, and also with your provider. Um, so yeah. I can see those as especially when you have I know we've talked a lot about blood pressure, but Im imagine someone with heart failure just 10 pound increase gets them back in shortness of breath and back in the hospital, right? And we're talking about readmission penalties. We're talking about increasing uh, cost of care for the population. But when you're monitoring, you're seeing that weight creep up. It's so much cheaper for us to tell the provider we're going to increase their water pill, you know, higher dose and get that weight down and prevent a hospitalization. So those patients are very grateful. Well, you know, we're holding their hands on, on a daily basis. We're, we're and if you just think about it, we're, we're there, uh, as you said, monitoring when that, when that weight uh, goes up in that congestive heart failure patient goes up three or four pounds. It's not after they end up in their emergency room and in, in a critical position and, and we, we prevent that. So. Um, communication is, is what we're talking about, constant communication with these patients. And I, I firmly believe that communication prevents a ton of problems that non-communication causes. So then with that said, um, you know, how, mu how much time does this take out of the pharmacist day, out of sta staff members' days? What are you seeing? And, uh, and, and if you can tell me, if you can tell us what the, your ROI is on this, uh, Maybe you can or can't, but let's start with, you know, what, how much time? Well, Medicare has made it easy. You got to monitor for 20 minutes. That's one unit, right? So for every patient and the 20 minutes are accumulated over a month. So I can monitor today for three minutes. I can monitor next week for five minutes. So it's a 20 minute accumulated time for the first. So if you say, and if you tell a pharmacy, uh, for 20 minutes, the revenue is about 50 to $55 for monitoring and how you split with the providers, you can make the economics, right? And you don't always have to use a pharmacist for every step of the way. So our technicians are doing more in the monitoring as well and only escalating. So I think Medicare has already given us a guidance. 20 minutes is the first unit. And so that was 50. That was fifty ball fifty dollars, right? Something. Correct. But that fifty dollars now you have to negotiate your fees with the provider. Sure. You have, okay. to, you have to create that revenue split with with the provider, and uh, you know, uh, one of my sales pitches, and I might have learned this from Amina, is you go to that physician and say, "How would you like to have a a pharmacist on your staff at no charge to you?" You know, a pharmacist and make you some money. Yeah. <laughs> Give you yeah. value and bring us some net back and yeah. it's at no headache to you not your employee you know i think i would sure. always sign up for that <laughs> yeah so you're, you're providing a service for them they're getting revenue and they're not they're not having to do anything almost sure. nothing, almost nothing so what i mean is what and i know this has to vary because obviously different you're negotiating a separate deal every single with every provider but but uh you know what 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 do you think is so reasonable and what have you found to be reasonable with the providers you're doing business with? I think the more value you bring, you probably could live with a lot of money. So if you're, if you just say you're just a monitoring company, well, that that's what the technology is, but it's the pharmacy knowledge behind medication management, you know, and getting those patients to outcomes and goals is the value. So with that, I feel like you don't go wrong, even whether it's 80, 20, 60, 40. And most of these services like Bob, I know Bob doesn't just offer remote monitoring. So this becomes an add-on to services that we are already offering to the practices. Right. 
So what we generally do on the front end, because it's it's new to some of these prescribers, providers, and we're, we're kind of interfering with their clinic on the front end until we train that biller, until we make the staff understand what's going on. So, and I don't know what I mean to this, but what I generally do is go in or originally with a 60-40 split where the clinic gets a little more on the front end. And then after three months, we drop it down to 80-20 or 75-25, whatever we can negotiate uh, to 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 our favor sure because we are the ones that they're not doing the work we are doing the work and uh we really haven't had any pushback one or two clinics pushed back a little bit thought we were a little bit high and they didn't use us at first and then after three or four months they had done nothing and they came back to us and said okay 20 percent is better than nothing you know so and then yeah. then after we get on board they see our value and and they realize it is a bargain and now it's hard to find any practice that is not being measured right. for their outcomes. So we had a practice that was doing remote monitoring in-house. They were having the revenue, but when they got their scores for one of their contracts, they had X number percent of patients, blood pressure not at goal. And I said, well, so what are they doing when they're monitoring? He said, Amina, I know what you want to tell me. I told you so. I said, no, I'm just curious. <laughs> like, you know, you know, but I told him just looking at the platform, that's not the solution. So they switched over to us because they needed to meet those goals. Patients were not at do optimal doses. There were drug interactions. There was none adherence. So he quickly said, I get the value the pharmacy brings. Yeah. Sure. And, and, and I, ha I have a couple lines of question here, but that made me think right off the bat there. Is there a time limit? Will Medicare say, or, you know, will they say, we aren't paying anymore? We haven't seen any improvement for six in the last six months, or the last 12 months or whatever. When will they cut, cut you off? Thank you for asking that question. And this is why I believe pharmacists are a key to this. Okay. Technology that just monitors and does nothing is increasing cost of care. So if you're a practice with 500 patients making this kind of money and still your patients are ending in the hospitals, the ERs, and still costing, Medicare will find no value to this program, right? So that's why when you, I'm, I'm more pharmacy-driven service and use the technology of choice rather than a technology-led service that does not have the clinicians backing this up. Well, I think it's like anything you want to, obviously your, your goal is to have positive outcomes. And if you're just monitoring and not, not doing something about it, then it, it is a waste of money. So uh, we, want to, we want to prove and, and, and certainly report those positive outcomes. And is there a time limit or is there, you know, or, is I, I, or does it just vary as to what the, when Medicare will say, okay, enough snuff. The good news, Medicare is increasing revenue in these services and okay. it's adding additional code times that if, even if you go above 20 minutes, here's an additional 40 to $45 for every additional 20 minutes. So definitely Medicare sees this and COVID may just have helped it. I think that just proves the value when, when they do something like that. Certainly. Okay. So, you know, Amina, you mentioned that uh, Bob does other things and I'm sure you do too. Um, I guess I have two, two questions that are related. First is, you know, uh, what other, what are those other services? And then uh, do you find that starting one before you start the other is, is important? So in other words, maybe remote patient monitoring is the first thing you do, and then you are doing this clinical service and this clinical service, or is there a clinical service that you should do before you're doing remote patient monitoring? So all these remote patient monitoring, chronic care management, uh, behavior health integration, they all fall under non face-to-face -face monitoring of patients between visits, right? You don't need to be at the doctor's office. You can do it from your pharmacy, you can do it from home. So remote monitoring is the newest one of these codes. You know, they've, we've always been doing, whether it's annual wellness visit, it's been a buildup on beyond office visits, what we can do with patients and what they call population health management. So if I think remote patient monitoring may be the easiest, Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it might be the easiest. 
and they something that hooks a patient? Well, it, I guess the easiest is, is, is probably a good way to describe it. But Brad, as you were saying, there's so many other things that, that once we get the patient hooked, there's so many other things. And, and we're working on now, now that COVID is over and we can certainly go back to classroom settings. Uh, uh, these patients that we have relationship with, they, they, a lot of them are diabetics. And so we're, we do, do DSME, uh, diabetic uh, education for our patients. So rolling these patients in are, are a lot easier uh, now that we have a relationship with not only the patient, but with the prescriber as well. Um, you know, obviously pharmacy is migrating to, uh, rapidly toward a more clinical services model. Um, and I know we, we're close to the pharmacy school and I have students through here all the time. I think we're going to push to having over 50 students come through my pharmacy this year. And these students are sharp. Their clinical knowledge is, is unbelievable. And putting them in a setting, a practice to where they can use that knowledge, whether it's RPM or CCM or annual wellness visits, whatever you want to do with them, it's wide open because we are building these relationships. Okay. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's great news. Um, so, um, and, and you wouldn't say that there's one that you should do before the other or, or would you say this is you the know, easiest? So do it first. I think it's about what the practice needs, right? Okay. And you have to be open and flexible. For example, I went to a practice and I was talking about these services and they said, you know what? Our ACO wants us to have an annual wellness vi visit completion rate of 80%. Can you help me there first? So while we, it's not about us, it's about our collaborator and what they need and find valuable at this time. And then we can always add on to those other services. I think that's a great point. You got to find out what their pain points are and see how we can work with them to, to help them resolve their pain points. Okay. Um, so, you know, I was going to ask if, if there, is there an ideal pharmacy business model um, where uh, RPM works best, but um, and I think you've you've kind of answered that. Do you can you expand on it at all? Well, again, uh, you've got to have obviously a clinical services model in place. That's that's the first place to start, which a lot of pharmacies do not. Uh, they're not thinking clinically. They're still in that uh, reactive business model of just filling as many prescriptions as quickly as they can and getting the patients out the door, never really having a conversation. Well, that's that's an old broken model and, and getting involved clinically with the patients um, is certainly your, your first step, whether it's just monitoring their blood pressure or offering a cup uh, uh, to check it in the store or blood sugars, talking to them and, and getting more involved, which opens up, you know, more and more conversations you can have. Uh, so. Yep, the business exists because uh, we have entered value-based medicine, value-based contracting, and in order to provide value uh, to the health system, one provider cannot do it alone. So I think pharmacists are poised with the accessibility, the knowledge, just the patient, multiple patient interaction, and you know all this is evolving. I would hate for pharmacies not to make themselves a product that can be sought out for these ACOs, for these doctors who are, are getting penalized because they are not getting their patients at goal. Yet here we are, we have them in our database, we fill their prescriptions, we deliver to their home. There's no other healthcare provider that has this much access and insight to patients than pharmacy. So I would love for us to capture that. And that's why the whole mission about CPSN, aggregating ourselves together becomes so crucial that pharmacy have to lead the way into the services or a new profession will be born called population health care coordinators. <laughs> Take these codes, do them. And we've been there all along. That's correct. And you know, I I hear pharmacists just all over the nation saying, well, that won't work in my area. Folks, I'm in rural Mississippi. My town has a population of 8,000 people, and we're in five clinics in this area. I mean, it could be done anywhere. You just 
pharmacists have got to realize that we are on the forefront and we've got to act. And uh, a lot of us have through CPSN and glad for me to mention that. That's a, that's a great movement and um, it's got legs. So let's, uh, the, those that haven't done it yet, um, you know, what, how do they get started? What would you tell them to do first? First thing they need to know that while it sounds simple, you do have to do work. So when people go through these trainings or they watch a webinar and they fail, they feel like this is it. I'm never going to do it again, right? Mm. It requires relationship building. It requires speaking a new language because when you go to market to a provider, you got to know what their pressure points are. So those are important. I wanted to make sure because I know so many people, oh, I tried and it failed. We failed many times before it worked. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's important to know that. So while it could sound simple, you have to do a lot of work to make it to to make it work. There are many resources. I know I'll be helping uh, CPSN write playbooks so we can get CPSN membership, you know, to to get this information out there because survival of everyone is survival of us. Uh, there are uh, many ways. Uh, we have Avant Institute. We have free webinars that people can look at. You can reach out to people who are doing it. Go visit Bob while he's doing MedSync. Look at what he's doing the rest. So resources are out there. Just don't bother Bob. You got to make sure you take him out to dinner first. <laughs> <laughs> That's a prerequisite. He's very busy. <laughs> are, there, are there entities that will help with this? I mean, I think I read about a, a few companies out there that you, you kind of uh, establish the relationship with the doctor, but then they'll reach out and talk them through the whole process of getting this thing set up. Is, well, yeah, they've, got, they've like got to be trained. And Amina mentioned, you know, Avon Institute, which is her model and reaching out to CPSN and getting, you know, just finding out where, where can I go? You know, they can certainly point you in the right direction or, or just visit your associations or NCPA and say, who's doing this? And what can I have, where can I learn? You know, you can't just sit back and say, well, nobody's teaching this or nobody's coming to me. Sure. I mean, you've got to reach out to someone and be proactive. Uh, and it's out there, you know. And have the confidence, honestly, to pitch it yourself. Yeah. Okay. Heart to heart, provider to provider. I know what you were saying. Some companies will be the gatekeeper and go in. A lot of our providers are tired of being sold things. And everyone is trying to sell them things. But I don't think a pharmacist is really in that group because we have something that's very valuable they need. So the more you learn to speak the language, the more you are confident of what you can offer, those transactions go a lot easier. Yeah. Sure. I mean, that all drives to your credibility as well. Um, and being that independent pharmacists are highly, you know, one of the most uh, highly rated professions usually in the top three every single year, right? Using that, uh, using that, uh, it really does give you the credibility to, to talk to the provider. And I see what you're saying about using somebody outside. You're the one with the relationship. Have the confidence. Have the learn. confidence. So. And it's time to move from, I always say this, all those providers who like you, call you, text you, it's time to move from friend zone to business. They can help you unlock a lot of financial potential, but you need to show them how. It's got to be a win-win proposition, obviously. Sure. Well, listen, do I, I, we probably need to wrap up here. Do either of you have any parting comments? I just did mine. No more friend okay. zone. We've been helping <laughs> them for a long time. They have tons of population health care codes that they can unlock. And you can do them. So go for it. And certainly, if anybody wants information, they can reach out to me. Uh, it requires dinner, of course. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm happy to help point them in the right direction. And, you know, I want us all to succeed. It is, and I mean, I touched on that. You know, this profession is, is, is about helping each other out. And, and I know years ago, certainly us independents, maybe we were at odds with each other. But you know, I have my neighbors down the road here that independent pharmacies that I want to see them succeed, you know, and, and I will do everything. And I mean, it's the same way to help them succeed. And uh, cause I always learn something from them when I, when I work with uh, other pharmacies, I always pick up some information. 
Absolutely. We're all in this together. And that's what we're trying to do here too at RMS. So, well, listen, Amina, Bob, I really appreciate you coming back and joining us again here at CLIMB. And uh, it's been great. I think we had uh, there's so much great information in what we just discussed. So really do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you for having me. With NutriButler by RMS, serve your patient's health on a silver platter. Help improve patient outcomes, integrate therapy recommendations, increase your supplement sales, and create happy, healthy, loyal customers. Well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Please keep an eye open for the CLIMB newsletter that should be coming to you shortly from Karen Deckard here. And as always, please remember to share the event, share the videos, share the podcast. Uh, you can find the recordings on our website um, or on the Pharmacy Podcast Network. Yeah, and I want to add my thanks to all of you who continue to join us month after month. And, you know, this is a real privilege for us to get to do this and to, to, to try to help all of you uh, make more money in your business and uh, help your patients succeed as well. Um, I do want to add a, a follow up to the, the panel discussion we just had. You know, now the, is really the time to take this on, folks. Uh, timing is everything. And it's only a matter of time between Walgreens, CVS, the chains go after this service. You already have those relationships in your communities with local physicians. Um, try to partner with them and make this happen now before, you know, the chains get involved. This is, this is your time. Timing is everything. And, uh, you know, let's make it happen. Um, now, uh, that's really it. This is a wrap for uh, this month's climb. Again, I want to thank you for joining us. In just a moment, Karen Deckard is going to come on and do after climb. So again, a, a breath of fresh air. You don't have to see me and for another 20 or 30 minutes. Um, Karen is uh, our director of sales and marketing, and she's going to talk to you about credit card processing options here at RMS. We really have tailored these solutions to meet your needs, and I, she's going to go through that, and I think you're going to learn some things as well. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over. We're going to end this session, say thank you again. We'll see you next month, and hang on so you can see Karen talk about credit card processing. Cheers, everyone. Welcome to After Climb. I'm Karen Deckard, the Director of Sales and Marketing here at RMS, and today we're going to be talking about your RMS credit card processing options. I know this isn't anyone's favorite topic, but the right processing solution can have a huge impact on your costs and your cash flow, customer perception, even what programs you offer in your pharmacy like home delivery, meds to beds. Uh, my goal today is that you'll come away from this presentation feeling a little more comfortable with some of our processing terminology, and if you're considering a change anytime soon, you'll have a better idea of what to look for and what to look out for. So we've got a lot to cover, and I don't want to put anyone to sleep, so let's go ahead and just dive in. To really understand where we're at with credit card processing options today, we have to go back in time a little bit and look at all of the things that have occurred over the last 15 years that have made pharmacies such a unique space to process in. Dating back to the early 2000s, Credit card processing was simple and straightforward. Processing in a pharmacy was no different than processing in, say, a convenience store. It was fairly common for us to encounter pharmacies that didn't have point of sale systems. Uh, and when it came to processing with RMS, just like today, there were a range of processing choices available. Integrations were simple and straightforward. Uh, and usually the biggest variation in functionality between processing options was usually whether the integration supported pin-based debit or debit as credit. From the outset, we tried very hard not to place restrictions on who our customers could partner with for credit card processing. Uh, a customer could hunt for the best rate, find the partnership that made them feel the best, and usually be good to go. So needless to say that if this was the world we were operating in today, I wouldn't be giving this presentation. So what changed? In 2007, the IRS created IIAS, or Inventory Information Approval System Standards. These standards were meant to more tightly control 
what your customers could purchase with an FSA or HSA card. In other words, they realized that some people were going into pharmacies and spending their health benefit funds on beauty items or gift department items. The honor system wasn't working, so they created IIAS standards. In order to comply with these standards, the Special Interest Group for IIAS Standards, or CGIS, was born. They created certification procedures that would allow merchants to accept FSA cards under the new regulations. This process, which still exists today, requires a point-of-sale system and a credit card processor that are certified with CGIS. Now, as I mentioned at this point, it's not unheard of for pharmacies to not have point-of-sale systems. So in addition to full IIAS certification processes, the 90% exemption rule was created for pharmacies whose sales were made up of at least 90% eligible products. Based on the original eligible products list, this was a good chunk of independent pharmacies. Um, with a little help from their credit card processor and a short form on CGIS, pharmacies could bypass the requirement for point of sale. Unfortunately, it didn't work very well. Many card brands wouldn't accept transactions from exempt merchants, and we still encounter this issue today. So what IIS standards really started was a narrowing of the options pharmacies had to choose from when it came to credit card processing. Not only did they have to have a POS system, they needed one that was certified with CGIS. Then they had to select a credit card processor that was certified with CGIS and certified with their point of sale provider. Um, now today we have CGIS certifications with a wide range of processing companies, um, but not every processing solution supports IIAS standards, especially as we get into some of the newer processing service gateways, IIAS also limits what comes to market and when for pharmacies, which we'll talk about a bit later, later on. Uh, importantly, CGIS and IIAS are still a factor, uh, despite significantly smaller eligible products list um, than we had in 2007. Outside of the certification, processing representatives need to understand IIAS standards and be able to navigate CGIS. Next, I want to talk about PCI compliance. It's a term you probably hear fairly regularly. Maybe it means something to you, maybe it doesn't. But we can't have a thorough conversation on credit card processing without at least briefly touching on what this means and how it plays into our options and solutions. PCI stands for Payment Card Industry Compliance. PCI is a set of regulations, standards, and requirements put in place for the secure processing of credit and debit cards. It is the card brands, so Visa, Car MasterCard, Amex, their response to the data breaches that plague merchants resulting in stolen card data and fraudulent transactions. Every merchant is responsible for their own PCI compliance. And what this looks like for you really depends on uh, a number of different factors. Um, what payment applications you use, your point of sale system, what your processing solution is, all of that. Um, for merchants with a lengthier PCI self-assessment process, we really rely heavily on the credit card processing company to advise merchants. So again, some expertise is really important here when you're selecting a processing relationship. If you're not compliant, you're probably paying a non-compliance fee from your processor. And if you were to experience a breach, you could be severely fined or lose your ability to process credit card transactions altogether. The other piece to PCI is that hardware is certified under PCI regulations as well. Um, and those certifications have set expiration dates. So this is just another limiting factor on what processing solutions we can use and the hardware we can sell because everything has to be PCI certified. Now, let's fast forward a few years. We've come to terms with IIAS standards. We're getting more comfortable with PCI regulations. It's more difficult than it used to be, but manageable. Then along comes EMV, Europro Europay, MasterCard, Visa, chip and pin, whatever you want to call it. Um, EMV isn't new technology, even when the payment industry announces their intent to migrate processing in the United States to it around the 2015 mark. Um, at this point, it's been in Europe for uh, since the early 90s, I believe. Um, the purpose of EMV is to prevent credit card fraud. That little security chip that we all have in our cards now prevents somebody from creating a duplicate of your credit card and then using it. Assuming they use it as a brick and mortar merchant, that uses EMV technology. Um, EMV was highly misunderstood when it came out, and still today there are some misconceptions. Um, so let's clear those up really quickly. Um, EMV does not prevent against the data breaches. Um, it wouldn't have prevented the major card data breaches that we all grew used to hearing about in the early 2000s. Um, EMV is not a requirement. You don't have to have it. You don't have to be able to accept chip and pin cards as a chip and pin. Um, you won't get fined for not having EMV technology. 
However, if you process a chip enabled card as a swipe transaction and that transaction is disputed by the card holder, you accept liability for that transaction, otherwise known as a chargeback. While it's not required, um, EMV is now standard for all of our integrations, uh, meaning we can't set you up on a new credit card processing account without it. Um, also, interestingly enough, EMV is kind of where IIAS standards came back around and caused some problems. Processors had to certify hardware solutions to be EMV, EMV compliant um, and essentially code brand new solutions. Um, and this, you know, it costs money for everybody. Um, and because pharmacy solutions were a small piece of that puzzle for them, um, and they required the addition of IIAS processing capabilities, most companies tackled those last. Uh, EMV compliant solutions that pharmacies could use came much came to the market much, much later than pretty much any other retail vertical. Some processing solutions never do it at all. So now you might be seeing a trend. We've started with a retail vertical that wasn't all that different to do business in than any other, but we've slowly narrowed down to a pharmacy credit card processing um, solution that's, I mean, it has to be very specialized. It's a very specialized segment of the market. So now that we've set the stage a little bit, I wanna talk about encryptions. First, we're going to talk about the thing that actually does what most people think EMV does, which is end-to-end -end encryption, or E-to-E-E. -E. E to E E virtually eliminates chances of a data breach, uh, card data breach at least, by encrypting the card information at the time of entry. Customer card data never touches the point of sale system, making this a much more secure processing solution. Um, however, E to E E does not protect against physical card skimmers. Um, it is standard on all of our current inter integrations here at RMS. You can't implement a credit card processing solution, a new one at RMS without this basic level of security. The next encryption item is validated P2PE, uh, or so validated point-to-point -point encryption. Um, validated P2PE is the same basic technology as EDEE. It works the same way. However, validated solutions have gone through a rigorous process um, to be vetted and certified by the PCI Security Standards Council. Um, they're the folks that kind of govern PCI requirements where all the certifications go through. Um, there are more controls in place, so like chain of custody for devices from the point they're shipped out to the point they're implemented at the pharmacy. Um, validated P2PE is available as an add-on for many processing integrations, um, but it's a smaller subset of customers right now that want this option, so not everyone offers it. Um, we have a number of different pathways to get there. Um, a benefit of validated P2PE is that it does limit your scope for PCI compliance processes. If you're on a standard processing solution, um, even an end-to-end -end encrypted processing solution, which are all of ours are standard that way, you could have a pretty lengthy self-assessment process. Um, but this convenience does have a cost. Um, every validated P2PE provider we encounter charges merchants um, some monthly fees in addition to standard processing rates. Um, so it does, does come with an additional recurring cost there. Um, last important note is that both validated P2PE and EDEE still require merchants to visually inspect card acceptance devices and follow other basic PCI compliance requirements. Last note on encryptions is just a quick touch on how, um, how hardware encryptions work and what those are. Um, so your credit card processing device, your signature pad, uh, is injected with encryption protocols. These have a range of purposes for everything from your end-to-end -end and point-to-point -point encryptions to debit encryptions for pin-based debit. Um, why does this matter? Um, well, it's, a lot of it's behind the scenes stuff, but it does impact both your implementation and anytime you wanna change processors. Encryptions are usually different across processing platforms or even within the same organization. Um, First Data, for example, is a huge company. So an account that's boarded through a First Data independent sales representative is going to have a different set of encryptions than one that's boarded through Bank of America, let's say. Um, devices generally can't be injected remotely. Um, so a device is physically sent into encryption facility before it can be installed. So that would be before your implementation, if you're a brand new customer, or if you're changing processors, um, you know, either your new hardware would have to be injected or existing hardware would have to be sent in to be re-encrypted. So it does add just a little bit of a layer of complication and some changes there. Uh, a few other things to know um, before we move on. Um, I wanna talk about a couple more key concepts. Um, first one is tokenization. 
Tokenization is how you securely keep cards on file and process card not present transactions. If any of you have a Rolodex of credit card numbers or an Excel spreadsheet or whatever else, <laughs> that's a big PCI compliance no-no and could result in fines or again, even the loss of your ability to uh, accept credit cards uh, at your pharmacy um, if you were to experience a breach. Um, the solution is to create tokens. Um, so a token, basically, um, you enter the card information on your processing device um, and it will provide you with a token that gets attached to the customer record. Um, it's just basically a unique set of you know, characters um, that references you know, that card at the processor level. Um, so then you have a token method of payment that's on your till. Um, and when you want to charge a card that's for like a mail order transaction or delivery, the customer's not present for whatever reason, it could be for uh, curbside pickup. Um, you just select your token met method of payment select that customer on that card, um, and that processes the transaction. Um, so essentially, there is now no credit card information on your, on your store network or physically in your, on your premises, which is much more secure and compliant. Um, I know that that's a, was a mouthful and a little bit convoluted. So if you do, you know, if that's something you need for mail order or something like that, just let us know and we'll walk you through how it works. Um, the last piece is NFC. Um, NFC stands for near field communication. This is contactless payments um, like Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, Google Wallet, all of that good stuff. This again is nothing that's required for you to implement. Um, it's good to have as convenience based, you know, feature based on your customer demographic. Maybe you get requests for it, maybe you don't. Just something to keep an eye on. Um, and, and maybe uh, if you're you know, making a change, look for that feature. Um, both of these options are available on a broad range of our integrations. So they're they're fairly standard. Um, so what we've kind of gotten to here is that processing for pharmacies can get complicated really quickly. Um, and there's a lot of places where a processing partnership can fall short. First, we're dealing with latency. Processing technology can take longer to get to the pharmacy industry. And all of these regulations mean that there are, are fewer direct integrations, i.e. Uh, RMS is your POS solution. We don't connect to first data directly. Uh, we connect to platforms that specialize in processing integrations and make the connection that way. Um, this additional layer, it simplifies things um, and opens more options overall, but that added layer does mean more people having to get involved for anything new, and it, it just takes a bit longer. Um, then there's the problem that there are a lot, a lot of processing representatives out there, and to put it simply, not everyone can support a pharmacy. I know that they'll tell you they can. I know they'll tell you they probably worked with RMS before. They probably haven't. <laughs> um, but you probably get solicited by processing reps on a regular basis. Here's my cautionary note. If your processing representative doesn't understand the concepts we've talked about today, those are red flags. Um, often we run into implementation roadblocks, meaning they can't, they can't set up the account up you know, properly. It does have to have very specific parameters um, to, be, to integrate not only with our system, but to be compliant and work with CGIS and all of that good stuff. Um, so if we don't receive the right encryption keys or important, important account info um, is missing, you know, that just it creates some unnecessary frustration. Um, you know, our, our team, we pretty much always, you know, we almost always get past it because our team that handles these transitions is very persistent. Um, but there's probably another option that avoids all that frustration out there. Um, bottom line, just give us a call before you sign any agreements so we can review everything with you and make sure it's going to be smooth because credit card processing is necessary for your business every day. And it's one thing that we don't, you know, we want it to be smooth and easy. Now, as I mentioned, you're likely getting solicited by processing reps on a regular basis. That's because, you know, I don't know, are you really happy with your credit card processing solution? Um, apathetic for it. It's there, you know, it's, you don't think it's charging you maybe too much money or it's just working. So we're going to set it aside. Um, but we do talk with customers looking to change processing accounts daily. Um, we hear statement, we hear things like statements are confusing, hidden fees, you know, that, that weren't there when we were initially quoted, lack of support post go live, um, rates that skyrocket like my cable bill every 12 months when my new customer, dis my new customer discount goes away. Um, so how do we make it easy? You know, everything I've told you so far adds up to credit card processing not being easy. Um, our goal, of course, is to make it that way. So when we approach processing solutions, we want to eliminate some of the variables uh, that we talked about today. Uh, control areas where we see the most customer dissatisfaction. Save you money whenever we can, but still maintain flexibility because at the end of the day, it's, it's your choice in your business. 
So here's how we accomplish that goal with our processing solutions. Um, we have multiple integrations with processing platforms. Um, this allows us to connect with most major processing entities. Most of these platforms have some licensing costs up front, and then everything else is covered as part of your RMS support um, outside of your processing fees after that. Um, IIAS certification assistance is part of every implementation um, because FSA card acceptance is a must for pharmacies. Um, so we're going to make sure that's taken care of. Uh, EDEE, um, the end-to-end -end encryption protocol, it's standard with all of our new integrations, as well as EMV and NFC. Um, so in most, and in most cases, tokenization is going to be available, um, but not all processing integrations support it. So we just want to double check that if that's something you're looking for. Um, we do offer validated P2PE, um, again, multiple pathways to get there if that's something you need. Although, as I mentioned earlier, that option does add some recurring expense. We've covered a lot of ground today, um, and I just want to talk about one more thing um, that you might not have heard about yet. Um, so we're almost there, just bear with me. Uh, even with so much of every setup standardized, we found a lot of our customers were still frustrated, dissatisfied with credit card processing issues. Unfortunately, uh, most of those problems like rates and customer support were out of our control. So we decided to cut out as many variables as possible uh, and moving parts as possible and created RMS pay. Um, so with RMS pay, um, instead of working with a bank or a, a independent sales rep, for processing, you, um, you work directly with your RMS customer success manager. They know exactly the setup, exactly the integration we need to use. There's no back and forth. There's no question is it's, if it's going to work, it's going to work. Um, and it just, it makes that, that setup process so much smoother. Um, outside of that, though, one thing that, you know, we really like is, you know, being able to offer flat rate, transparent pricing. Um, and based off of your volume and your average ticket size, because those are really the factors that um, impact processing rates for you or should impact processing rates for you. Um, and of course, maybe the best part, support for RMS pay is just like your standard RMS support. It's 24-7. Our reps are there. Just give us a call. Um, and of course, we have the standard processing packages that check all those functionality and capability boxes that we talked about earlier. So FSA card acceptance, um, of course, that's a must. Um, end to end standard, you can go validated P2PE if you need to. Um, tokenization, NFC, EMV, all those are there for you. So if you're interested in, RMS, in the RMS pay program, it's really easy to get started. Um, just send us a copy of your most recent processing statement We'll decode it to figure out um, how much you're paying each month in fees and see if we can save you some money along the way. Um, if, you are, if you are on older processing hardware um, and looking to get upgraded, like say you haven't transitioned to EMB yet or something like that, um, we can definitely assist with that during the process. Um, RMS Pay actually is a great way to go in that case um, because hopefully we can offset some of those upgrade costs by saving you money on processing and offering some you know, 0% interest uh, payment payment plans to spread out the cost and the impact for you. Um, and you know what, if you're getting a great deal and we can't save you any money, we're going to be upfront with you on that. Um, the whole point is to streamline processing, make it easy, make it less stressful, and hopefully put some money back in your wallet. Um, most of the time we can do that. Um, sometimes we can't. Um, we just appreciate the opportunity to try. So if you're interested, just let us know. Um, and that is all I have for you today. Um, so thanks so much for hanging in there with me. I know this was a lot of information. Uh, we did cover a lot. So if you have questions about credit card processing options, need to get more in depth on anything that we discussed, um, please feel re free to reach out to me um, or to anyone here at RMS. I can chat with you directly or we can put you in touch with your customer success manager um, to take a look at your processing solutions. And anyway, we can make things a bit easier for you. Um, so thanks again for tuning in and I look forward to seeing you next time.